Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. The wait is over. President Biden will finally pay his first visit to the border since becoming president. He'll be in El Paso on Sunday on his way to a summit in Mexico City. The president today also announcing that Cubans, Haitians, Nicaraguans, as well as Venezuelans will be turned back if they don't apply for asylum before entering the U.S. In his speech, Jesse Degollado says the president also praised humanitarian efforts along the border. President Biden singled out those who have been lost in the bitter debate over immigration. I want to thank all the nonprofits, the faith groups, the community leaders and other volunteers. Those like Del Rio's Valverde Humanitarian Border Coalition, a faith based short term respite center for migrants before leaving for their destinations. It saw 23,000 of them in 2021, a record year until nearly 50,000 showed up last year. How did you do that? <laughs> with a lot of support and generosity. By volunteers, individual donors, mission groups, churches, and other organizations. Without so many people, we wouldn't be where we're at today. President Biden acknowledged exactly that. These religious and civic groups represent our, our nation's generosity, the best of our country. They really do. They really do. And they're a powerful rebuke to the hostility and even the hate which many people face when they arrive here legally. When and if they do, Burroughs says she hopes they'll remember the kindness they first encountered here. Regardless of what the federal government uh, does or doesn't do, we are still going to be here doing what we do. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. The police are investigating a deadly 18-wheeler crash on San Antonio's northeast side. One man died at the scene. It happened around noon in the southbound 410 ramp and southbound I-35. That's right near Ben Zingelman Road. Our reporter Alyssa Cole tells us that freeway interchange will be shut down for the next several hours. If you're planning to drive through this northeast San Antonio area, keep in mind that the 410 southbound ramp is closed right now. It'll be shut down for several hours, but right now the I-35 access road, the frontage road is open. Traffic is flowing through that area, but let's get into more details about this incident. We know the driver of the 18-wheeler lost control, causing it to flip on its side and burst into flames. San Antonio police arrived within minutes of the crash, and they tell us officers at the scene and witnesses helped rescue the driver. Now, unfortunately, the passenger was unable to be saved, and he died after he became trapped in the wreckage. The medical examiner is currently working to identify that person, but right now crews are still working to clear out this area. The truck was carrying a spool of metal cable, uh, very heavy. Uh, it's, it's unknown how the how the, the, the rig lost control, but it did. The driver has minor injuries. He was treated here at the scene. And again, as mentioned, crews are still working to clear out the area. That 410 southbound ramp is closed, so you want to avoid that area. Police are urging you to take an alternative route or detour. Alyssa Cole, Case at 12 News. Tonight, a teenager is behind bars in connection to a deadly shooting of another teenager last month. Here's what we know. Bear County jail records show that 19 year old Fernando Canedo was booked yesterday and charged with the murder of Luis Garcia. The arrest warrant states that security video shows Canedo and Garcia driving separate SUVs. Seconds later, Canedo begins following Garcia and then shots were heard. The warrant also says that Canedo was found with a gunshot wound to his face and his stomach. He told officers that he was robbed on his way to a gym. Messages on Garcia's phone show that he told Canedo to meet him. Canedo's bond is set at $250,000. It's the footage we first showed you at 5 o'clock. An Edgewood School District police officer using his knee to pin down a teenager by his neck. The incident happened in November in a parking lot less than a block from Kennedy High School. It also happened after that teenager that you see right here repeatedly punched that officer several times in the face. And even though the student appears far from innocent in all this, the controversial technique has been banned by many police departments because it often restricts the breathing of the person being restrained. There's two officers on top of him and he's already restrained and that's what matters. With Edgewood ISD officials, we reached out to them for comment. They have not named the officer or said much about the incident at all. 
only that they're investigating what happened. The Guadalupe County population has grown over 30% in the last decade. That's according to census data. So more people there means a greater need for first responders. It's why Guadalupe County launched its first full-time year-round fire rescue team. Archimelia Juarez shows the county's investment to protect more people living in the Seguin and New Braunfels areas. Over the last few years, volunteer fire departments in Guadalupe County were responding to 300 to 400 calls a year. Now they're responding to nearly 700 calls. So there's a lot of growth coming from the larger city areas out into the rural areas. There's a lot of neighborhoods being developed. Guadalupe County commissioners approved the budget for 10 full-time firefighters and another 10 part-timers. The chief of Guadalupe Fire Rescue, Heath Lipke, says each will rotate to provide 24-7 coverage along the Highway 46 corridor between Seguin and New Braunfels. Within this next year, uh, we really want to develop our staff um, on a professional level, as well as hopefully create more positions within our department and provide the citizens with the care that they deserve. The fire department plans to focus on their district and help surrounding volunteer fire departments. This is the Guadalupe Fire Rescue's temporary fire station. They chose this location because of its access to I-10 and Highway 46. Next, the county plans to open three fire stations around the county. The county will also use funds from the American Rescue Plan to purchase new equipment and new fire trucks. Our next truck should be here by this summer. Camelia Juarez, Quesa 12 News. All right, we showed you earlier the situation at I-35 and Ben's Engelman, especially in the southbound lanes. This is a live picture right now, and you can see I said at 5 o'clock it looks like it's a construction zone. They're cleaning up not only the ramp itself, trying to scrape off what's left there, but you can also see some of the uh, burned grass that's off in the distance. Does not look like this will be reopened anytime soon. The San Antonio nightlife, live music and business community mourning the loss of an influential figure on the St. Mary Strip. Blaine Tucker died Friday at the age of 42. His cause of death is still unknown. Tucker was the co-owner of a bar called The Mix and a beloved friend to those in the industry. RJ Marquez spoke to close friends about Tucker's impact on San Antonio. I thought I was dreaming, to be honest with you. I, I thought it was a bad dream. Luis Munoz, like so many others, learned early Friday morning that his close friend, Blaine Tucker, had suddenly died. He was like a fiercely loyal friend who always had your back. Everyone's just heartbroken. Uh, I am as well. I'm trying to be strong. Tucker was one of the co-owners of the mix on the St. Mary Strip. Well, he loved the strip because it is really about music. It's one of the local places where you can hear music. Blaine Tucker bought the mix back in 2015 with two very close friends, Eric Handen and Steve Mahoney. So he ran this place for years, but his lasting legacy here will be helping secure billions of dollars in funding to help many live music venues during the pandemic. Tucker was also a local attorney and one of the driving forces behind the Save Our Stages Act, which later brought $15 billion in federal funding for live music and entertainment venues. He really, he really was uh, uh, somebody that, that cared deeply and really wanted to, to be involved. Just to hear that this happened, is, it's, it's shocking. Tucker worked closely with former city councilman Roberto Trevino to help struggling venues. Trevino says it's a big loss for the local business community. It didn't just save a lot of businesses along the same area strips. It, it was really something that was a citywide effort. He's just going to leave a huge gaping hole in a lot of people's lives and also in the business side of if some of the things that were happening in our city. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. Look outside with live cam this evening. Another nice sunset, chilly starts, pleasant finish. That's kind of how we're going this week, Adam. Yeah, it's really the trend where you, know, you want a sweatshirt in the morning, but by the afternoon, a okay, sunny and mild. We started the day at 43, then we made it up to 75, another 30 plus degree temperature jump from the morning into the afternoon. And we'll see more of it in the days ahead, just not every single day. We'll get to that in a bit. Right now, Canyon Lake 65, meanwhile, 74 in Divine, 72 Hondo. 
Converse at 65 and Kerrville right now at 69. Temperatures falling off quickly with our clear sky, calming wind, dry air, good radiational cooling. 58 by 10 o'clock midnight, we're at 55. And then tomorrow morning, we're back down into the 40s, but for the most part, upper 40s. 48 in and around most of San Antonio and even surrounding areas just a few degrees lower. We do have some dampness returning. I'm going to time that out and let you know what I mean in terms of showers and rain chances in just a bit. Thanks, Adam. A new type of pacemaker could keep hearts beating stronger and longer. What makes this different? Next. Coming up tonight on the night beat, 14 drinks in four hours. That's what police say Clayton Perry was served at this Northside bar. Now the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission investigating the case with the councilman. The potential punishment it could face. Plus. Hello. Hi. I'm with KSAT 12. Is there a manager I could speak with? After earning health scores in the 70s, two local restaurants had multiple violations on their plates. Their cleanup efforts when we go behind the kitchen door. And 2023 marks the beginning of a new Texas legislature and the debate over a $27 billion surplus. The spending priorities for lawmakers and taxpayers. Could we be seeing a check? We're going to head into day one with a preview. Those stories and more tonight on the Night Beat. The cardiac arrest that Bills player DeMar Hamlin suffered on the field Monday night has shoved heart health into the spotlight. Around 200,000 people this year will have pacemaker surgery. A pacemaker sends electrical currents into the heart, shocking it back into regular rhythm. But after six years or so, the wires or the leads can start failing, often when people need them most. Ursula Perry reports on a new type of pacemaker that may keep hearts going without using any wires at all. How did you feel six months ago? How do you feel now? The answers to these questions can reveal a lot. Sometimes it's age, sometimes it's not, and sometimes it's a sign you do have a heart problem. Patients experience fatigue, tiredness, lightheadedness, dizziness, inability to you know meet uh, the needs of daily life. People with slower than normal heart rates may need a pacemaker that sends electrical impulses to shock the heart back into a normal rhythm. Baptist Health electrophysiologist Vanaka Sagi is leading a study using a new leadless or wireless pacemaker. It's smaller than a triple A battery. Unlike traditional pacemakers, this new leadless pacemaker does not require a large incision in the chest. Instead, a catheter is used to insert it inside the heart. The advantage of this new technology is that there are two separate pacemakers that are implanted, one in the bottom chamber, one in the top chamber. The two devices wirelessly communicate with each other to restore a normal heart rhythm. They will find a, a remarkable improvement in their quality of life immediately. Today's currently FDA approved pacemakers can't be retrieved when they fail. In other words, that pacemaker stays inside you and a new one is put next to it. These wireless pacemakers actually can be retrieved with just a simple little catheter surgery. The old one taken out, a new one put in. They should be approved by the FDA sometime in 2023. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. We've got Sky 12 flying right now above some sort of incident involving first responders and obviously some blocked traffic here along O'Connor Road. This is in the 12,000 block. We're not quite sure exactly what has brought police out here, but it looks like we've got some first responders there with flashlights going, searching for something in the road here. Yeah, it, it looks as some sort of an accident. You can see there at first I thought maybe that vehicle, the dark vehicle in the middle was on its top and it's not, but you can see the uh, front of it crumpled up. So some type of accident out there. We're going to continue to monitor this situation. Let's turn to the weather now, and we have had some really chilly starts to the day, but things have shaped up pretty nicely, but we know we need rain as always, Adam. We do, and we'll, I think we'll get some rain, just nothing to get your, just don't get your hopes too high and don't get too excited about this. Uh, let's take a look at the rain chances and notice how we boosted Saturday to 60%. Hey, looks great, right? Looks great on paper, but it comes with a caveat and an explanation here. We're talking drizzle, 
and light sprinkles. So less than a tenth of an inch. Actually, most of us probably a trace to five hundredths of an inch Saturday morning on into the early afternoon when we have that nuisance dampness around, but not much to really show for. Let's talk about our overall pattern quite across the Lone Star State. Of course, the big story in the national headlines, West Coast still getting battered with the precipitation. They'll get a break tomorrow, but then Another system, you see this swirl here out in the Pacific, that's going to head on shore with another atmospheric river, basically a big narrow plume of heavy moisture to bring them more precipitation. But this is all part of, uh, it's connected to at least, what's going to be affecting us as we get into the weekend. This dip in the upper level flow, a little disturbance here is going to move eastward. Once that crosses, crosses over the Rockies, it'll help develop a cold front. And then that cold front will move through late Saturday and help develop a few showers, especially east of town. Let's take a look at our future cast here and notice how it paints a very gray picture. We've been talking about this for days, a gray, damp and dreary start to the Saturday to your Saturday with just a few little sprinkles shown in green. And now the future cast is close enough in time where we can share it with you and it depicts the same thing as we've been expecting. Dampness, nuisance, dampness, wet roads, wet trails, wet sidewalks on Saturday, but not much to show for it. Once we get into Saturday evening and Saturday night, we could see a few showers and storms, actually real showers, develop east of town, uh, particularly Lavaca County, DeWitt County, Carnes County, points generally east of San Antonio as that weak cold front moves through. We could we could use the rain, of course. We'll take all that we can get. Not that this is going to be a drought denter, but the newest drought monitor, it's in, updated every Thursday, updated today. Exceptional drought, the worst category. Northern Bear County over to Medina Lake, northern Medina County, parts of Bandera County, and especially Kendall County. That's where we have the worst category of drought. And really, it's rampant and most widespread right here in the San Antonio Bear County area in surrounding communities. 50% of Texas is considered in drought. And you look at the January precipitation outlook from the Climate Prediction Center, below average. That's what this brown area depicts right here. The odds of being below average through the month, month of January. Of course, West Coast likely to be above average, already well above average. 66, the temperature right now, dew point of 33. Dew point's important here with what's going to be happening in the days ahead. Right now, you don't feel any mugginess in the air. Dew point's in the 30s. That's going to be changing, though. Tomorrow, the dew point rises. Tomorrow morning into the 50s. Then we get to Saturday morning. Dew point's low to mid-60s. So actually feeling that mugginess and stickiness back in the air. And that's going to add to the overall dampness, fog, reduced visibility, and just general wet conditions to start our Saturday. As for tomorrow, brief fog early, 7 a.m., 48 degrees, some low clouds quick early and then quickly dissipating, having some sunshine by noon and into the afternoon, 67 at noon. So maybe some long sleeves early, but you won't really need them by the noon hour than a high temperature of 75 south southeasterly wind at 10 to 15. 73 in comfort, the high tomorrow. Bandera 75, Floresville, Nixon, Pleasanton in the upper 70s to near 80 degrees. And we'll see a little kind of drop in our temperatures this weekend, but nothing significant. 72 on Saturday, then down to 68 on Sunday. That weak cold front wipes away the humidity for Sunday. And the next week, it's basically what we've been experiencing this week. Some comfortably cool mornings followed by pleasant afternoons. I just wish we could muster up more rain from this system and from that nuisance dampness. At least there's some chance. Thanks, Adam. All right, he collapsed after tackling a receiver on Monday Night Football. And we are finally getting a bit of good news when it comes to DeMar Hamilton, Larry. Yes, uh, today is the first time I've seen any of his teammates smile because they got good news about DeMar Hamlin. I should say smile since he went down Monday night. Coming up, DeMar Hamlin is communicating with his family. Plus, Baylor, Libero, Lauren Brasenio is proving hard work definitely pays off. Coming up. Spurs are 0-2 in the new year after losing to the Nets Monday night and falling at the Knicks last night, 117-114. San Antonio bounced back from a 13-point hole to make it close. They had a chance to tie the game, but the Spurs were called for a five-second violation after rookie Jeremy Sohan couldn't make an inbound pass with 5.6 seconds left in regulation. 
Honestly, um, I mean, we're not to point the finger at nobody. If we're going to point the finger, I, I'll take the blame. I feel like that, uh, you know, I, I didn't, uh, you know, go as fast as I should have on the play. So I feel like that it's not on Jeremy um, because he, he was running the play. If anything, I'll put the blame on me. I'll take the blame. I'll take full uh, responsibility for the play. Um, you know, Jeremy did what he was supposed to do, um, and I messed it up. So uh, coming out stretch, I take full responsibility for that, and um, I take accountability, and I, um, I'll be better. Spurs will host the Pistons tomorrow night at 7. Guard Devin Vassell will have an arthroscopic procedure performed on his left knee on Wednesday in New York. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. We have great news regarding Buffalo Bill safety DeMar Hamlin. He's now communicating and writing with his family who've been at his hospital bedside since he went into a cardiac arrest Monday, doctors said today. And his first question was, quote, did we win, end quote. Dr. Timothy Pritz responded by saying, quote, the answer is yes, DeMar, you won the game of life, end quote. Hamlin remains critically ill in a hospital's intensive care unit, but he began to wake up Wednesday night and it appears his neurological function is intact, Pritz told reporters. His dad said the first thing that he's going to ask when he wakes up is who won the game. <laughs> and sure enough, that's what he did, man. And uh, as teammates, you, you love hearing that response, that the first thing on his mind wasn't, you know, poor me. It was, how are my teammates doing? Did we win this game? And that's powerful in itself. Allen added that the Bills will play Sunday with less heavy hearts after this good news. Yesterday, we caught up with Baylor libero Lauren Brasenio while she was working out at SA Force. Lauren graduated from Cornerstone Christian High School and went to Baylor as a walk-on. Back in late November, while watching the NCAA Volleyball Selection Tournament show at Coach McGuire's house, she got the surprise of her college career during a white elephant gift exchange when Coach awarded her with a full scholarship. How cool is that? Yeah, I think it definitely proves that, you know, hard work does pay off and just um, loving the game so much that even like going to Baylor, like I knew like what I was getting myself into, but I was like, you know, it's scholarship, no scholarship. Like I love this game and I'm willing to do whatever it takes to travel anywhere, just anywhere away from my home in order to play the game that I love. But also just after getting the scholarship, not allowing um, scholarship, no scholarship, letting it define who I am as a player and just um, continuing to love the game as it is. Lauren cried tears of joy while surrounded by her teammates who were all in on the full scholarship surprise. Yes, I think that was one of the main things that like kind of like caught me by surprise because I'm best friends with a lot of my teammates and just the fact that they kept that away from me, I think I think is what made it like even more special because I know some of them kind of like uh, like let things slip a little or anything like that. So I think that's definitely something that made it a lot more special. Lauren is 19, entering her junior season at Baylor with two years of eligibility left. Best white elephant gift ever. Yeah. Right? Great yeah. surprise. Yep. All right. All right. Thanks, Larry. Thank you, Larry. We've got some breaking news I want to bring you right now. Reports of gunfire and uh, shots fired, perhaps somebody hitting the 4,000 block of East South Cross. Now, to give you an idea of what we're talking about, this is the Pecan Valley area, not too far from Roland Avenue. It's just south and east of downtown. You can see... EMS on the scene. It looks as if it's an apartment complex. Yeah, and, and it looks like there are several vehicles in that apartment complex right now. So not sure exactly what we have on hand in terms of injuries, who might have been involved in this shooting, but that ambulance we can see driving away uh, doesn't look like they're in too big of a hurry at the moment. But of course, if anybody was injured, you know, that's going to be their first priority. But no word on what led up to this shooting, no word on any injuries, but again, an apartment complex, it looks like from this view, is now the scene of a shooting that police are there on the 4,000 block of East South Cross to investigate. We're going to talk about Texas legislature and maybe some property tax relief when we come back. We are less than a week away from the start of a new Texas legislative session from property taxes to the border to a billion and billion and billion yeah. dollar surplus. A lot to talk about with the editor of the Quorum Report, Scott Braddock, who is out of Austin, knows all things Austin politics. So, Scott, thanks for sharing some time with us. Is Myra, there... don't hold me to that. I know everything. <laughs> hey, look, oh, it I was going to say, you know, you're not limited to just Austin. I mean, you know. 
Right. We, we, we do move around the state, but I was going to say Happy New Year to y'all. If, if, 20, if 2022 was not for you, in 2023, we'll see. I'm trying to be optimistic. Oh, yeah, I like, I like that. It. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens. And that's what we're mm -hmm. looking forward to next Tuesday when we kick off mm -hmm. this legislative session. You know, we've seen sessions in the past where there seems to be one issue that mm -hmm. takes all the focus, really dominates the session. Do you think that it's shaping up to be something similar this time around? It may be. And, you know, um, when a married couple fights about money, it's never that there's too much of it. But at the Capitol, it's going to be the opposite. Like you said, there's going to be so much money in the bank that there will be big arguments about what to do with it exactly. What has been said about that? Well, the governor and the lieutenant governor have said that they would basically like to take about half of this record surplus that we're expected to see, uh, which is going to tie. If you add everything together between general revenue and what's in the state savings account, that's the economic stabilization fund, sometimes called the rainy day fund it's approaching 45 or 50 billion with a b dollars wow. um, and so what what to do with that um the uh, governor and lieutenant governor have said hey they want to spend at least about half of it on property tax relief now there are some complications with that because and it's a little arcane but uh the state has a, a constitutional spending limit and so they'll have to figure out uh, how to navigate that um, but there's not a whole lot of meat on the bone as far as any real proposal to get that done so far so we'll all be you know tuned in to see exactly what's going to happen as far as what happens on tuesday pomp and circumstance. It's like, uh, you know, the first day of school, all these folks who haven't seen each other for uh, almost two years. And some people who are freshmen who have never been seen before at the Capitol, people will be, you know, getting together, socializing and very different from 2021, 20, uh, when it was the uh, COVID session, if you will, when there wasn't as much of that. And the, a lot of the members didn't really get the chance to know each other as much uh, as they will get to this time around, because we'll kind of go back to normal without the social distancing, the masks and all of that. Yeah, not nearly the drama that we've been seeing in the nation's capital either over the last few days. Right. You talked about no concrete proposals right now, but I mean, mm -hmm. there are a lot of people who are at home that's like, I would love property tax relief. I mean, mm -hmm. however it comes. I mean, are we talking about something as drastic as cutting a check to taxpayers, to homeowners right now? You know, it's interesting, Steve, they've talked about that before, but in the uh, 2021 session, there was a proposal to send people uh, $500 checks uh, as sort of a rebate for their property taxes. But because the state doesn't uh, collect property taxes, that's a that's a local thing. Um, it, it was discovered through the process that if they sent checks to people, that in and of itself would be taxable income. And so that becomes less attractive because of that. Um, there are several things they could do. They could once again raise the homestead exemption, which is a constitutional amendment, which means that two thirds of the House and Senate would have to sign off on that. So whatever they would come up with on that uh, would have to have the support of not just Republicans in the majority, but also the Democrats in the minority. By the way, that kind of consent Census building that's necessary is one of the reasons you won't see the kind of drama that we're seeing in the Capitol in Washington. You won't see the same kind of speaker fight. Um, and look, there are other things they can do. What one of the most consequential things that they can do, and you'll remember this in 2019, the legislature rewrote some of the way that schools are paid for. Uh, and they basically said so lawmakers at that time did a lot of work to set us up for what we have now, which is a lot of extra money and what they would do with that to contain property taxes at the local level. Because as you know, the biggest line in your property tax tax bill is that school district uh, tax for the for your local ISD. Um, and what they would do is flow billions of dollars through the school fun, uh, funding formulas. And uh, there are probably five people on the entire planet who fully understand the school finance system in Texas. I'm not one of them, but yeah. I do know this. I do know this, that when uh, that was done in 2019, about $3 billion was spent to uh, compress taxes locally, basically offering some kind of relief uh, because of the uh, growth in appraisals and because of the growth of Texas as a state. Remember, we still have about 1,000 people moving here every single day. Because of that growth, the cost of offering that same kind of relief to taxpayers will be about 6 to $7 billion, something like that. So that starts to eat into that uh, surplus we're talking about just by doing that. Let's uh, talk about another topic that we brought up with you last time you were here, the idea mm -hmm. of legalized gambling in Texas, or at least yeah. in some aspects. Has that mm -hmm. gained any momentum since we last spoke? If anything, it's going in the other direction. You may have seen that uh, Lieutenant Governor Patrick, who, of course, presides over the Texas Senate, and the way the Senate works, it, one of the ways that it works is that the lieutenant governor is kind of like the teacher at the front of the classroom. The senators have to have their hand raised and they get, you know, they're called on by him to bring up different proposals. 
he sounds very uh, 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 um, he almost, almost sounds against it. He doesn't sound fully against it, but he has said that there's no uh, movement forward on that. Uh, and he said that in a recent interview. Um, and so he's kind of throwing cold water on it. Um, so I'm not sure that there's any real momentum for that. I do. And that's on casino gambling specifically, where he was asked about that on sports betting, which I think we talked about previously on KSAT. Um, there is maybe a chance that the lieutenant governor might be open uh, to having some sort of uh, retail locations for sports betting. But apparently, this is according to my reporting, he's not in favor of people being able to do it on their phones. He doesn't want it to be online, which, of course, as you know, for the sports betting companies like DraftKings and uh, Barstool Sports and others, they want uh, folks to be able to do it on their phone online. So that's a point of contention. Yeah, a lot to watch there. Do you expect any of the drama between the House and the Senate that we've seen in, in legislatures past? Oh, yes, that's that's where it really happens, Steve. Uh, you know, because we have a Republican majority and have for so long now for a generation, uh, it's not so much Democrats and Republicans fighting with each other, even though that does happen. Uh, but most of the fights at the Capitol end up being the Senate versus the House. Uh, and as uh, former Speaker Strauss from San Antonio used to say, uh, if the House and Senate don't agree to do a certain thing, well, then that thing just doesn't happen. So you, again, have to come back to consensus building and putting together a governing coalition uh, when it comes to any of these big proposals we're talking about if you want them to become Texas law. Scott Braddock with a Quorum Report, who knows all things Texas politics. How dare I say just Austin, the whole yeah. state you're keeping tabs on. So thanks for being here this evening. Myra, thank you. Good to see you all. And Happy New Year. You Happy too. New Year to you too. Thanks, Scott. We'll be right back.